Ah, uh, yes, indeedy. We are in the month of December, and we are kicking things off uh, light and fancy. Yes, we are. I'm your host, the Mandator Reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radlich, and you have tuned into Source Material Live. Uh, tonight, I am joined by Alexis Haina of Honeysuckle Rose Creations. How you doing, madam? Hey, happy to be here. And the master of all things Transformers, and that's why he's here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Cole Marantad is back on the show. How you doing, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we are talking, get ready, uh, hardcore comic book fans. Do you like Batman? Do you like gritty comic book, dark, Deadpool? Do you love blood and guts? Well, you're not getting any of that tonight, because tonight we are talking My Little Pony, Transformers. Yes, indeed. Uh, this was written by Ian Flynn. The <laughs> it was a four issue limited series. The cover date for the first issue was July of 2020. The in store date was August 5th, 2020. Uh, so we have been Alexis and I have been plotting this out for a long time. When they announced that the Transformers My Little Pony crossover was going to happen in comic book form, uh, Alexis and I tripped over ourselves trying to get to the computer fast enough to type, we have to do this on source material. Ain't that right, Alexis? Pretty much. <laughs> Hasbro's having a field day with us this week. <laughs> um, so we threw it on the schedule for when the series ended, uh, which was not that long ago. All four issues are out now. The trade will be coming out later this year. And I extended an invitation to Cole Marantet because, you know, we were doing the Netflix three-part cartoon series, uh, War for Cybertron, and he's a big fan of the Transformers series. But I have to ask Cole, and we talked a little bit about this offline, but for the people, for the people, uh, how much do you know about the My Little Pony franchise, and were you reticent to discuss this book because of that, or were you like, no, 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 give me more ponies? I, uh, cards on the table, I watched with rapt attention and loved every second of the first season of the most recent My Little Pony series, uh, Friendship is Magic. Uh, never got into anything after that. Kind of left it on the back burner. And then I heard about this series coming out. I heard they were crossing over Transformers with My Little Pony and my immediate reaction was sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> I want nothing more than this right now in my life. Um, you've read the Transformers have crossed over with everybody like Robocop, Terminator, Star Trek Ghostbusters um, and then prior to that it was all the IDW Revolution franchises like we talked about that with the comic book revolution where they crossed over with G.I. Joe and Mask and whatnot. of the um, limited series like the Ghostbusters one I know you said you read that one have you read any of the other Transformer crossovers? Uh, I read Transformers Terminator I read Transformers Ghostbusters, like you said. Um, I think that's it, though. I don't think... Like, I didn't read the Back to the Future one that is either coming out now or is about to come out. Um, and I did not read the Star Trek one. Well, we'll have to ring your bell again when we do Transformers Back to the Future. Because you know Jesse Starcher can't be stopped. And he has to do oh, that no. book. <laughs> no, he's definitely going to be all over it. Yes, indeed. It's already on. We have a whole Back to the Future week planned for that. Um, what possessed you to watch My Little Pony? Do you have a sister, a wife, a daughter? What, what, what's the deal here? I have a very good friend that I've known for ages. And she is really big. She's always been really big into My Little Pony. And she messaged me one day out of the blue and was like, Cole, you need to watch the new show. That's all she said. <laughs> it was okay. on Netflix at the time. And she was just like, oh, no, it wasn't on Netflix yet. I had to, I had to um, 
acquire the episodes. Yeah. Um, and she was just like, you need to watch it. Don't talk to me until you've watched it. So I said, <laughs> all right, I'll bite. And I watched the first episode and I was hooked. Um, it was just, it was exactly the kind of lighthearted fun that I needed um, to sort of contrast what I normally, my normal intake, which is a lot, I wouldn't say darker and grittier, but like more mature themes. And it was just a nice little slice of fun and brightness to contrast that. I watched it because I have a daughter who was interested and so me, her, and her mother would watch them together. And I was aware of the original My Little Pony uh, franchise from the 80s. I, I grew up in that era. And I, I was curious about it. And I have to say, and we'll bring Alexis into the conversation here, the Friendship is Magic show, for the audience that it was intended for, with the, with the fair that it was dealing with, was actually not badly written at all. Like, I, I have to say... There were bits of it that I actually thought were really funny and really witty, um, insightful. And I actually, what, uh, what of it I enjoyed, I actually, enjoy, I, I, I really did enjoy. Alexis, what did you think of, and I know you watched it, and you say you're currently watching it now. Um, and I, and I, I have more questions about the expansion of that series. But what did you think of the original reboot there, uh, Friendship is Magic, My Little Pony Show? When it first started, I didn't know much about it. I, just, I, I, it, I saw a lot of memes and a lot of posts on uh, online about it, and I was just like, okay, this is taking off. Uh, what got me interested was there was a YouTuber I used to watch who did a full My Little Pony retrospective, including the previous generations, as a build-up to discussing Friendship is Magic. And I was like, okay, now I'm really curious. Watched his video... I was immediately, you know, into what he was talking about, especially since this was developed by Lauren Faust, amazing animator who has worked on some of my favorite TV series like Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends and Powerpuff Girls. Uh, this is this is the wife of Craig McCracken who gave us Powerpuff Girls. So it was just like, okay, this should be interesting. Okay, now Started I know why the animation style looks so damn familiar. Started watching it fell in love with it i have watched every episode of friendship is magic probably a hundred times over rarity the unicorn is my freaking spirit animal i love this show all right i have two questions one did you go to the theater to see the my little pony movie because we did the Radlich family yeah. we trekked to the theater my son in tow we all went and we saw the my little pony movie of course i did it came out on my birthday fantastic now, have you stayed with the series where they mer where they morphed into upright humanoid equestrian girls? I watched most of the equestrian girls movies mostly out of curiosity. I have to admit, the first one when I saw it, it was like, "Wow, Hasbro! I know that you know you you aim for your show to be as toyetic as possible, but this is you know pushing it even for you guys." <laughs> But I did like Rainbow Rocks, the second one. I thought that was a little bit more enjoyable. I'm not a huge fan of what they've done with Equestria Girls because I felt that they flanderized the characters a bit too much. It it was just kind of like, oh, you know, all of a sudden they've... It's hilarious. You know, you imagine the ponies to be just cardboard cutout stereotypes, but these ponies are actually much more well-developed characters than their human counterparts. <laughs> Um, Patton Oswald, a comedian I often reference on any one of my podcasts, talked about his daughter and like he introduced her to Star Wars and she was like, meh. And the thing that she's really into that he doesn't have time for is My Little Pony. And then the joke is he then goes into a whole rant about the, the very details of the show. Uh, if, you, if you have an opportunity to see that part of his stand-up, it's actually pretty funny. But yeah, I, I, My Little Pony, when you give it a chance, I mean, and I know there's the subculture of like pony boys out there and then the ridicule that follows that I think if you just let all bronies. that yeah br bronies um, I think if you just let, let all that aside you know if you you know like Cole said if you just give it a chance and watch it it's not bad at all 
You know Patton Oswalt did voice the character on the show, right? Oh, did he? Who did he voice? Uh, the first character we come across in the book, the one who's reading the comic, he's a character called Quibble Pants, and that's and Patton Oswalt voiced him on two separate occasions. You know, if anybody could voice Quibble Pants, a character named Quibble Pants, it would be Patton Oswalt. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, it's a, a very actually a very touching story. You're familiar, of course, with the tragedy with Patton Oswalt's uh, first wife. Yeah, she passed away. She was very young when she passed away. I don't know what she pa- what she passed from though. Yeah, I can't remember. I think it was like a, a heart defect or something uh, mixed with the medication. They didn't know was going to have that problem. Um, he, but, you know, he's remarried now. Yes. There is an episode in the last season uh, that's on Hulu now where Quibble Pants comes back and he has a girlfriend who has a daughter from a previous marriage that they don't say anything, but we're left to assume that uh, her her husband died. And he's trying to bond with the daughter over a sport, even though he's not a sports pony. The girlfriend and the daughter are played by his wife and his daughter. Wow. It was a, he brought them on. They did this great episode together talking about, you know, coming together as a new family. It was so touching. If you know the backstory of the voice actors, it was really great. Uh, staying with you for one more question, Alexis, how familiar are you with the Transformers franchise? Not as extensively. I've seen the first two movies. I hurled my soda at the screen repeatedly during the second movie. (laughs) You know, like any sane human being. I was born in 84, so a lot of my friends who are also children of the A's talk about how they're crazy into Transformers. They are born in 81 and 82, and they, I think, were right at the window. I was just past the window for Transformers. I, w- I was the right age for Ninja Turtles. That was the fandom I got hooked into at that age group. Hey, so, so you didn't watch the old cartoons or anything or the cartoon movie? Your familiarity is with the Michael Bay movies? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into the comic book here. Um, the Comic Vine synopsis says, When Queen Chrysalis casts a spell looking for more changelings... She accidentally interferes with a malfunctioning spray bridge, like you do. What's this mean for our favorite fillies? They are suddenly they're sen- there are suddenly a bunch of Autobots and Decepticons in Equestria. And as the dust settles, Rarity and RC find themselves teaming up against a hostile Decepticon force. All right, so let me first say right off the bat, these four issues of Transformers: My Little Pony: Friendship in Disguise, which is a fantastic title. Um, There are two stories for every book, four books total, and there are different writers and different artists for each story per book. And there's no... Basically, once it's set up that the Transformers have crossed over into another dimension, landing on Equestria, um, there's different adventures taking place in different parts and different team-ups or whatever, and there's no overall arcing story here. Um, I mean... You can make a little hay out of the fact that the Decepticons are looking for a way to take over, but, you know, they're always looking for a way to take over. They're always looking for Energon. But basically, these are eight mini-stories over the course of four issues. So the first one is Transformation is Magic, written by James Asmus. And this is where we see... We start off on Equestria. Uh, okay, I guess that uh, the one reading the comic book there, that's Quibble pants or whatever you call them that's pan oswald pony nice touch by the way that equestria is written in the uh transformers font and when we get to cybertron that's written in the my in the my little pony font (laughs) yeah i thought that was pretty adorable um all right so there we see chrysalis i don't remember this character i remember um the the huh chrysalis chrysalis whatever um you were making my ears bleed dude (laughs) um I don't remember this character much from the cartoon. I know the, the dragon character that shows up later, but I, I don't remember a lot about this one. Fill in the blanks for me. Crystal showed up at the end of season two. She is queen of the changelings. Uh, changelings are your generic shapeshifter car- creations. Um, the idea is that changelings... It's kind of weird because there is a major arc in a later season about the changelings and how they're actually evolving and they become new forms. 
So this clearly takes place before that. But yeah, Chrysalis is obsessed with ruling. She uh, and her changelings feed on love. Like, literally, that is their source of their power. So she is trying to take control of Equestria so that she can provide all of the uh, love and, you know, and energy that her her uh, her hive needs. Um, then we shift over to Cybertron. Of course, the Autobots and Decepticons, Cole, are locked in the, the eternal struggle. They are fighting on the space bridge. And, uh, sh- um, uh, what's it? Shockwave. I yeah, Shockwave. Rem- I should have remembered that. That was like my favorite toy growing up. Um, <laughs> Wasn't that yeah. everyone's? I, I thought it, Shockwave was like everyone's favorite. Oh no, Soundwave. That was everyone's favorite. Yeah, Shockwave was one of the toys that make the noise. And uh, running. Around, <laughs> I was always a Grimlock guy myself. Uh, but Grimlock didn't make any noise. Shockwave made noise. If you 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 know if you press the trigger, he went whoa 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 whoa. And I used to shoot up the whole <laughs> house with it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I used to get pissed off with the cartoon because they left him on Cybertron. So here I had this toy, and I never got to actually see him do anything. Just annoyed the <laughs> crap out of me. Um, anyway, so Shockwave is trying to get the space bridge to work. And uh, as we go forward, uh, as... How do you pronounce it? Chrys- Chrysalis? Chrysalis. Chrysalis. All right, I'll get it right before the end of the show. Uh, Christopher. <laughs> Christopher. Uh, d- does her magic? Shockwave does his thing, and they leave C- Cole. They left poor Grimlock behind. I He's- know <laughs> it's okay. They get they fix it later. They I do. love it. All friends ditch Grimlock again. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> poor Grimlock. Clearly working on the animated movie Grimlock, where he's more comic relief than anything else. But uh, I love him anyway. Yeah, I was reading in the comments for this, there are multiple iterations of Grimlock where sometimes he's portrayed as perfectly, purposely acting dim-witted to outwit his enemies and others he's actually dim-witted and then in a third iteration he's a stone-cold badass. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Um, depending on which version of the comic or the cartoon or which era of the cartoon you were watching, Grimlock could be a completely different character. So we go back to Equestria. Did he ever show up in the go ahead. I was say, did he ever show up in the live action movies? Uh, he did actually, kind of. There's a T Rex uh, robot in one of the Age of Extinction later movies. Age Don't, of Extinction. That's yeah, the aren't they all bar- yeah, 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 they all like- th- they showed up at the end of Age of Extinction where uh, where Optimus Prime was riding Grimlock into battle. Yeah, he just they just sort of show up. Like, there's no preamble, there's no <laughs> setup of, oh, wait, there are Dinobots. They just sort of, Optimus Prime just goes into a valley in China and is like, hey, Dinobots. And they're like, sup? <laughs> okay, so I didn't know if that was Grimlock, because Grimlock has personality, and from what I've seen, I haven't seen Age of Extinction all the way, because I can only stomach so much Michael Bay. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Age of Extinction's the best. And I'd like to take this point to say, hi, Mike, hi, Robert Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree that we that Transformers: Age of Extinction is the height of the Michael Bay filmography. You can go Wasn't on. Wasn't that the one with the beyond obvious Bud Light uh, product placement with the, yeah, the was, truck? Why, yes, it was. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't seen that movie, but I've seen that clip. So I remember showing that clip to Andre, and he was just like, "That's from Saturday Night Live, right? That that they didn't actually put that in a movie." So, do you know the 60s Batman movie where um, Adam West is running around with a cartoonishly large bomb, and he tries to get rid of the bomb, and he, you know, he goes to throw it off a pier, and there are ducks there. He goes another way, there are nuns. You both know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes yeah. you just can't get rid of a bomb. Yeah, they actually have Stanley Tucci do that bit. <laughs> yes, they do, don't they? Oh, my God, I forgot about that part. <laughs> so, just as an aside... When Robert Winfrey and I reviewed that movie for uh, Damn You Hollywood, I don't even know if it was called Damn You Hollywood at that point, but we reviewed that movie, and it's one of our more infamous podcasts because we got into a knockdown drag-out screaming match over it. And (laughs) and he was like, it's too long, and I'm like, it's just right. There's nothing... The movie, you can't cut anything from the movie because then you lose important plot elements. And he was like, cut Stanley Tucci with the bomb. And I'm like, how dare you, sir? (laughs) (laughs) anyway um so yes 
they do show up in the fourth Transformers movie in one of the most awesome scenes ever, Optimus Prime riding Grimlock into battle. Back to the comic book. Um, we have lightning, we have space bridges, and Princess Twilight shows up with her glowing horn. Um, and out come the Transformers from the space bridge. They don't quite know what to make of them yet. They all separate and like land in different places in Equestria. Um, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee start to fall to their doom, and Princess Twilight saves them with her magical horn. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, Christabar and Megatron start pairing up, and she says, What exactly are you, and how can you be of use to me? Amusing! I was about to ask you precisely the same. Um, we have uh, Rainbow Dash and Windblade pairing up. And this is probably my favorite panel of this entire book. I guess this is an iteration of Megatron where he turns into a tank instead of a handgun. But you have uh, Chrysalis riding the t- riding Megatron as they attack the Autobots. Uh, this is fantastic. And this is where I that story that ends. I want that painted on the side of a van. Yeah. Chrysalis's face. There's no You can barely see any malice. It almost looks like she's going, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this I I need I need that frame somehow. Uh, that is fantastic. The only thing that's missing from this, this is a quibble with the no pun intended, with the artist is you don't see. Like I picked up that that was Megatron, but if you but you don't see like his Decepticon sign anywhere. So you just want so if you're not so if you don't know that in some iterations Megatron turns into a tank, you have been the faintest clue where the tank came from. That's true, but in all fairness, like I said, I, I know that Megatron turns into a gun, so when I saw him on take, I just like, well, I'm assuming that that's Megatron, and, and he turned into a tank to amuse Chrysalis. So. <laughs> yeah, there are several parts of this comic series that are, like, if you don't know about the IDW Transformers comics, or I assume there are parts that, if you don't know about the... IDW My Little Pony comics, they go over your head, and I think this is one of them. Yeah. Um, which reminds me, Cole, at some point you and I are going to have to figure out when we're going to talk about All Hell Megatron. I still have that sitting oh, on my God. shelf, and we, and we and I have to read it one of these days. It's uh, it's a read. I'll put it that way, and, <laughs> and we'll move on. Yeah, it's about the size of a phone book. Um, <laughs> Alright, so that's the end of that story. The next one is Shine Like a Diamond. Um, hang on here. Which is written by Ian Flynn, artist is Jack Lawrence, and this <laughs> this one's a cute story. This one, uh, you have Starscream, which Cole no- Cole recognizes that crown, right? Cole, where's that from? Yup, Star. That's from Transformers the movie, the old school one, 1986. When Starscream was king for a whopping two minutes. 20 seconds. Oh, it wasn't even that. <laughs> oh, was it 20 seconds? Yeah, I watched the video you, you sent me. It was 20 seconds. Oh, okay. yeah, this sorry, is was bad it? comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, do you watch the YouTube series Death Battle at all? I have in the past, but I not recently. One of their earliest shows was Starscream versus Rainbow Dash. And that was actually the video that got me into the series. I sent that to Mar. I was like, I think you need to watch this before we start. I so, will confess, I missed that video. I'll have to go back and watch it. Yeah, this is another My Little Pony versus Deadpool one that I saw in the um, previews. Anyway, Starscream um, is doing what Starscream does, trying to take power for himself, the snively little uh, coward that he is. And he's got some of the ponies there dressing him all regal-like. And uh, was a Rarity who says, Yes, darling, of course, just don't shoot any more of the block property values and all that. See? Yeah. N- nice touch with the other ponies, by the way. Those are all ponies that they've established work for her mm. in Manhattan. Um, in fact, you got, you'll get a kick out of this. You see the little... Uh, Little one down at the bottom right, uh, cream colored blue mane. Uh, mm-hmm. Looks like she's got a little flower. Her name is Coco Pomel. <laughs> nice. See, that's what I like about this comic: the attention to detail and the little jokes here and there. I I, I find this book like wildly amusing. Yeah, cause, yeah. I saw them like, oh my god, yeah. They they established uh, all these other ponies. Uh, Hell, I don't know if you, how well you guys know, but um, 
all three of the not the one not the orange one but the blue one the the male and the pink one on top are actually apparently designed off of famous uh designers the pink one is designed specifically to look like betsy johnson hmm. okay uh, well as we go through the panels here look who shows up but the first female transformer i've ever seen she showed up in the 1986 movie it's rc and she boots starscream right in the mush and there goes his crown uh my girl rc that's right she doesn't I always love the joke about rc it's like the first female transformer and of course she's pink of course she is she's like 86 come on now um <laughs> So R.C. Uh, gets into a fist fight with Starscream, and uh, he he runs away like a coward. Uh, she's, <laughs> you'll pay for this disgrace, Autobot. Yeah, I've heard that before. Are you all right, my little pony? Yes, thank you for your assistance. And uh, then R.C. strikes. <laughs> R.C., like a good superhero, not like Superman in Man of Steel, tries to put the area back together again, which I think is really funny. I wish they had shown destruction. They said that apparently he had blown up a couple of the shops. You, you did catch, by the way, the name of this town they're in is Manhattan. Yes. Har. Yeah. <laughs> the Har. puns. The unrelenting puns. So the next couple of panels here is Rarity and R.C. chumming up and becoming buddies uh, as, R.C., <laughs> as R.C. tries to put the town back together again. She gives her some sort of uh, cloak. Uh, they're still talking, talking, talking. Starscream is back. Yay! And this time he's brought... Help me out here, Cole. Thundercracker and who else? Skywarp. The, uh, the original Three Seekers. Yes. That is uh, what I'll say. That's what Starscream does best. He says, ah, I'm running away. And then he tries to come back with help. Yep. Oh, well, of course. So uh, our three Decepticons uh, come back. RC shoots back at him. And this time she pals up with... Rarity. Rarity gives her a shield. She's able to shield herself from the laser fire, and she returns fire, and she nails them, and they go, uh, screw this. I'm out of here. So she... Uh, <laughs> and she uses the cloak, and she throws it at the, the remaining two jets, and they retreat, and are... And finally, we say, and we are friends, aren't we, darling? Fast friends for sure. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Cole, what'd you think of the first issue here? I really enjoyed the first issue. The first half of the first issue is like that's all set up, so it was it was fine. Like there were some good gags and whatnot, but where this issue really shined was in was in the second story. Mm-hmm. Um, shine like a diamond. Uh, I liked that they I liked that they included Rarity, who is like Alexis, my favorite pony. Um, I liked that they had RC acting somewhat similar to her comic counterpart where she's a fighter and she's you know in your face and is willing to jump into battle but also kind of like her cartoon counterpart where she's more a protector and uh sort of a rebuilder of sorts they they mesh those personalities well together yeah i thought they took great care to make sure that both franchises were represented well in terms of personalities and how you would see them in other comic books or cartoons or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so far, so good. Um, I was surprised that there wasn't an overall story to this whole thing and then said there were sort of pairing off mini-stories. But I actually think once I got to the end of it that that worked really well for this book. What do you think, Alexis? I really enjoy it. Well, I am kind of glad actually that we had time with each of the different ponies. The main ca- there's six main characters, so the idea of breaking this off into different ones, so each one has a chance to interact with a particular group of uh, Transformers, I think was actually a very smart move. So you get to see each character's, uh, you know, well shine, you know, but on bump. And, yeah, I just love seeing anything with Rarity. Again, she's not just my favorite pony. She is my spirit animal. (laughs) All right, issue number two, uh, cover date, September 2020, in stores, September 2nd, 2020. And so here we have two stories. We've got um, Inspiring by Ian Flynn, and They Eat Ponies, Don't They?, written by Sam Maggs. And, oh, boy, Cole... 
We go, we were robbed in the first issue. He was disrespected, but God damn it, Grimlock is back. Oh, my boy Grimlock. Hot damn. Love the Dinobots. Uh, by the way, Alexis, I don't know uh, if you remember this or not, but, um, you know, the Constructicons are in this issue, and they were also represented in the Michael Bay movies. As a matter of fact, they're the Transformer where you got to see their jiggling balls, if you'll recall. Oh, don't remind me. <laughs> Why do you have to remind us of that crap? It um, hurts. The deep it, hurting. It really does hurt. My podcast network, we're going to talk about jiggling robot balls. Um <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's only so many cutesy pony shit you can take before you finally say, Robot Balls! That's right. That was my favorite part of that particular movie. Here we are, r- giant robot balls. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael Bay. Moving on. Um, so here we get Spike, who uh, sh- in- somehow went the other way in the land bridge and ended up on the Ark, which is the Autobot ship. And so he roams around and he finds Grimlock. Now, Cole, when we last left Grimlock, he was back on Cybertron. Is this ship not on Earth, or is this ship on Cybertron? I, I, I got confused here. What do you make of it? I just assume a wizard did it. Okay. You know, I just, I just <laughs> was reading the comic, and I decided to roll with it. Like, the Ark's on Equestria. Grimlock's there for some reason. It's fine. Let's just, let's just go. Okay. Because, yeah, as I, as I flip through this again, they're definitely not on Cybertron. They're in a desert somewhere, which jives with what was in the cartoon. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, just, it's fine. Just, it's it, fine. It's fine. Your, your first explanation was the right one. A wizard did it. Um, anyway, so Spike runs into Grimlock, who's the only one on the Ark, and they are bonding together, becoming friends, but that is sh- uh, quickly interrupted by the presence of the Constructicons. And Grimlock is not with his other two uh, Dinobots that he normally pairs around with, the Stegosaurus and the, uh, I believe, the Brontosaurus, whose names escape me. Um, so he's all alone here to fight the Constructicons, but that don't bother Grimlock none. He says, and Grimlock will crush them all, and Spike is just starry-eyed and adoring Grimlock. This is quite the pairing. So uh, Grimlock starts beating up on all the Constructicons as they are uh, the individual five bots. He says, puny Decepticons, even together, you are no match for Grimlock. And one of them says, you want to see us all together, animal? And Grimlock, realizing the mistake he's just made, says, eh, Grimlock and Grimlock's big mouth. And there he is. <laughs> Devastator! The most powerful Decepticon. We should rule... Oh, wait, I'm doing the movie again. Anyway, um, they say, prepare for extinction, Dinobot. Get it? Get it, Alexis? Because he's a dinosaur. Get it? He's hilarious. Get it? Unplanting puns. <laughs> um... Oh, Spike has seen all he can stand, but he can't stand no more as the uh, Devastator starts to have his way with Grimlock. Um, Spike, seeing that Grimlock is having great difficulties, figures out something to do. He runs into the Ark, and he reads Modern Cybertronian for Everyday Conversations and Teletran 1 for Dummies. Ha! (laughs) So he goes... (laughs) That was Spike's a fast learner, but even that's kind of pushing it. <laughs> Still adorable. Um, so he goes to the main engine console, which he turns on as Grimlock is getting the shit beat out of him. And uh, they, he uses the... See, see, call on that panel, the Ark is lodged into the side of a mountain. They've got to be on Earth, right? Because that, that's how it was in the cartoon. It would appear that they're on Earth, but I'm... Like I said, a wizard did it. Moving on. Uh, They turn the engines on, Spike does, and blasts Devastator into oblivion. And uh, the combiners fall to their individual selves on the ground, and they are cooked. At which point they go, retreat, retreat! (laughs) And Spike says, golly, that was loud, are you okay? And Grimlock says, Grimlock's sturdy. And they have another bonding moment where uh, Grimlock gives Spike all kinds of uh, compliments and says, you are a wonderful human being, never doubt yourself. Aw, this was a heartwarming story. And the, li- the last line is, uh, he c- 
be proud, little Spike. Grimlock is inspired by Spike, so Spike must continue to grow, okay? And Spike says, he called me inspiring, Cole. <laughs> Incidentally, Spike used pronouns is probably my favorite quote from this <laughs> half of the series. There's one later that I think beats it out, but Spike used pronouns is the best of the first two issues. I think funny. I know what your favorite other favorite line is, but I'll I'll ask when we come across it. It it's coming up pretty soon. Is it in the Fluttershy episode? It's in the Fluttershy episode. Okay, then I know what it is. <laughs> Um, so Cole, this was pretty great, right? You know, the Spike and Grimlock made for a great team. You have the uh, in canon co- ongoing feud between the Dinobots and the Constructicons. So they, you know, they made they made some great hay out of the Transformers and the Ponies in this first story. It was very cute, and for you know it's a split comic where they don't have a lot of time to get deep into things, I thought they gave you just enough fun uh, to read. What'd you think? Well, that's that's one of the things that really impresses me about these comics is they're all the stories are real snappy. They're just they get in, they tell their story, they get their action going. They you get just enough of a taste of cute and action packed and funny, and and then they get out before they ever say they're welcome. It's just it's a really these must have been really difficult to write because you're working with what is it like. 12 pages maybe maybe if that um and you got to tell a full story in in half a book so uh but kudos to the entire creative team on all these books they've done a really great job and again separating the characters through different stories i think really does help that Mm -hmm. can you imagine just how convoluted and crowded it would have been if we were trying to have the majority of Optimus Prime's uh, Autobots talking with the main six and Spike. Yeah, no one could get a word in edgewise, and you'd probably just get like maybe a little quip here and there from each character, but it'd probably be boring as hell. Right, it'd be bloated, is the is the big problem it would be, because there are so many characters that they would have to touch on. The best way to do it is by giving them their own spotlight. I feel like that's what happened when we read Revolution, where, especially not having read any of the backstory stuff, there was mm. so much going on, it was so busy. I think I complained that it gave me a headache to read. Yeah, it was a very... Revolution was a very, I want to say, dense comic, but it also leaned so heavily on you knowing what was going on in every individual story leading up to it that it was just the side of incomprehensible if you just jumped in on the event. Yeah, and uh, people can check that out in the archives... Uh, source material revolution it was a fun i mean it was a fun show to, you know to talk about and everything but i remember making that complaint that like i'm reading this going i you know alexis you used the word busy and that's really what it was like this by breaking it down this way you get uh, you get your fill of the character and like cole said before it gets before it overstays its welcome and gets overwhelming they eat ponies don't they <laughs> Uh, prepping with Pinky, and this is Pinkie Pie, and she has a cooking show, because God knows everyone has a cooking show these days. They're all the rage. This is weird, though, because Equestria, My Little Pony French was magic. They don't have TV. So, I, I, I don't really get what Pinky is doing, but I should also add that there is a familiar saying amongst those of us in the Brony community. It's Pinkie Pie. Don't question it. That tracks. Hey, listen, if Troy and Abed can have a morning show that wasn't being filmed and there were no cameras, <laughs> and <laughs> why can't Pinkie Pie? Why can't we all just, just get up in the morning and play t- television host? Well, if any, I was going to say, if any character on the show should have a cooking, or, uh, yeah, in Frenchman Magic should have their own cooking show, it is definitely Pinkie Pie. All right, so uh, she starts doing her cooking show, and I don't know who the hell Gage is, Cole. I don't know this Autobot. Gage is... He's hes not an Autobot, or... I think Gage is a he. I'm not... It's been a while since I read the comics that uh, Gage was in. No, Gage is a she. Oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, Gage is what's called a nail. A non-affiliated independent life form. <laughs> um, they are neither Autobot nor Decepticon. They're neutral in the... Uh, 
in the conflict. They're so from the like, IDW comics. So he's like Bumblebee is in the War for Cybertron. He's a non-affiliate. Yes, exactly. Um, and Gage was mildly important for a couple arcs in the uh, in the comics, um, but has never really been on any of the shows or in any of the movies. So kind of a deep cuts character for them to bring in. Well, Gage is the guest on Pinkie Pie's cooking show. And uh, they're going to make cupcakes. And because Gage... That's... Go ahead. No, it's that that's what Pinkie Pie does. <laughs> <laughs> and so what does Gage bring to the table? Well, he has brought all the way from across the space bridge iron filing casserole topped with my favorite energon reduction. <sighs> <laughs> just looks lovely, just mouth watering. <laughs> you know, not to be not to be that guy, but I thought they had established the Transformers fed on Energon that they did not eat food as such. <laughs> I don't I don't know if known in your various readings, Cole, that you got uh, that you came across the Transformers cookbook, but uh I'm fairly certain I'm right about that. It is a page one Energon, page two Energon, page three Energon. <laughs> um, yes, this is this is adorable. They they see they they're robots, so they eat iron filings. Get it? Get it, Alexis? They eat they eat like car parts and shit. Get it? Because they're if cause... you title this podcast "Unrelenting Puns," I'm going to be very <laughs> disappointed in you. <laughs> so anyway, um, everyone looks a bit stunned. But, uh, you know, Gage is a guest, and he's also a robot, so they, they, may, they may move on. But they are attacked. They are besieged by God. And it's Shockwave! Okay, so this is one of my favorite panels of this entire uh, series. Shockwave using an energy grater and an energy, like, whisker. Yep. Uh, yeah. He's uh, channeled the Daleks. This was fantastic. <laughs> As you do. Yeah, well, he's attacking a cooking show, so he's attacking with energy cooking utensils. It makes perfect sense. Well, Shockwave's all about the logic, and so he would only use the most logical means of attack. Absolutely. Which would be, of course, a cheese grater. <laughs> so he's here to... Um, Discovering how much pony it takes to fuel one Decepticon. You see, he's going to reduce the My Little Ponies into Energon. Always looking for Energon, uh, the Decepticons are. And so that's what we're doing here. And so he attacks... Did, Go ahead. did anyone cringe at the idea of a of pony plus cheese grater equals Energon? <laughs> that's too busy laughing to cringe at anything. Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I don't want to think about Pinkie Pie meeting the business end of a cheese grater. <laughs> well, uh, Shockwave, Gage, and Pinkie Pie. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so, much like in wrestling, Gage hits Shockwave over the head with what looks to be a cookie sheet. <laughs> and now Shock Shockwave has changed to a spatula and a spork. Um... Well, the spork is the most logical of all uh, of all yes. eating implements. It's both uh, fork and spoon. That's right. Anyway, um, so Gage... You know, I'm having flashbacks now to that Pinky in the Brain episode. It's like, get your pitchforks. I got a pitch spork. Stop trying to make pitch sporks happen. I swear I thought the same thing. I just didn't say it out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pinky, you must get to safety. No, I'm not leaving you. Uh, we're going to fry this full together. And out comes uh, Shockwave. He's got the spatula held high. He's going to Hassan chop him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Gage jumps into the fight. And he rips off the spatula and the spork. Shockwave is knocked on his tugus. Uh Gage grabs a, pot, a pan. Pinkie Pie grabs a pan. And bam, right into Shockwave's one eye. And like a cartoon character... Of sorts, his face is now flattened, and he goes back through the space bridge. An obligatory derpy cameo. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I noticed that too. Uh, let's face it; we would have been disappointed if she didn't show up at least once. It's true. 
Um, so we're back, and they've made their desserts. They've made their casserole made of iron filings and cupcakes, and that's all for Gage and prepping with Pinky. All right, issue number two. Your thoughts, Alexis? It's always fun to see Pinkie Pie just go completely off the rails. That's what her character does best. I didn't know that much about Gage either, but this was a lot of fun. Uh, just like I said, the insanity of Pinkie Pie versus Shockwave. It's like, but sentiment- sentimentality will never outwit smarts. It's like, that's, that's just comic gold right there. <laughs> Call your thoughts? Um, I thought issue two was... Uh was pretty great um as we said earlier the grimlock story i i popped hard for that but uh the Pinkie pie story was uh very entertaining um they made good use of the villain uh i think they included gage as sort of a blank slate like we just need a transformer in here who can mold to the situation at hand and so they can't like they wouldn't put Optimus Prime in here because Optimus Prime would just jump into battle. Same thing with any of the other Autobots. So they picked someone who was maybe not as well known, uh, is not as much of a fighter, so that they could build to that conclusion. Yeah. Well, then and I don't. If, I have a feeling that if it was Optimus Prime, it meant Pinky would have been like, "What did you bring all the way from Cybertron?" And Optimus would have been like, "I have no time for cupcakes." Yeah, I brought the Matrix. Optimus of always has time for cupcakes. <laughs> Optimus played basketball, ma'am. This is true. Touche. Issue number three, October twenty twenty cover date, uh, in store date October seventh, twenty twenty. Our two stories are as follows. We have Pet Sounds, written by James Asmus. Artist is Jack Lawrence. And The Flying Foxtrot, uh, written by Sam Maggs. Artist is Priscilla Tramontano. And here, this is where we get our Fluttershy episode. Um, See, I thought Discord, Alexis, was kind of a villain. But this is now the second time I've sort of seen him in a friendly role with the My Little Ponies. Discord is reformed in season three. He's still a trickster character. How can I put this? You're familiar with Q in Star Trek, of course, right? Of course. Discord literally is Q. Okay. I mean, they're both voiced by John DeLancey. Fair enough. No, no. Seriously, when they when uh, Lauren Faust wrote the um, the character, she actually said she put in her notes that he was a Q like character. To which the staff said, "You know, we could get John Delancey to voice him, right?" And she just was like, "Oh my God, are you kidding me?" Discord has been a fan favorite, uh, and part of the joke is that the only character who can really get him to rein in his um, chaotic nature is Fluttershy. Okay. Uh, they they are best friends. There's a lot of shipping for those who think that there's more there. I don't really do that kind of a thing. Woo! Is there Discord Fluttershy uh, slash fiction? Go sit in the corner. You know what you did. <laughs> I want an answer. I will stop this podcast. Uh, there's fiction. There's fan art. <laughs> There's sculptures. There's oh. cosplay. Oh, my God. Okay, if you find any Discord Shutterfly naughty sculptures, you must fi- send it to me in an envelope along with one of the Flutter dinners you Shy. made. Huh? Shutterfly. Shutterfly is a company that oversaturates their photos. Crystalis. Got it. <laughs> anyway, find me, find me naughty sculptures of these two. I must have one. This is what I do with my free time, people. <laughs> All right. So, um, what is this stupid character's name again? Uh, Fluttershy. I'll try to remember that. So, Fluttershy and Discord are having tea here. And, of course, uh, their, their tea time is quickly interrupted. Called by one of the best Decepticons ever. Everyone had this toy, and you couldn't have enough of the cassette tapes that went with it. Good old Soundwave. Good right? old Soundwave. How hard did you pop as a kid 
when um, Soundwave ejected all the t- all the cassettes, and Blaster showed up to fight back, and then he ejected a whole bunch. And then oh, one of the best man, the movie. that was like that was like the moment. That was the crowning Ooh. achievement of awesome. That's it was like it can never be cooler than this moment right now. I've got two robots shooting smaller robots that turn into cassette tapes at each other. That's right. They, amazing. They were uh, they they were overpowering Perceptor, and Blaster kicks Ravage. <laughs> like, just gives him a sidekick, and he goes, you know, kicks him right off off the screen, and he goes, "No way, two can play sick him." <laughs> so good. Uh, anyway, Soundwave. He shows up, and he's trying to get the lay of the land here. Um, <laughs> he's uh, scouting. He's securing uh, outcome. Outcome, Ravage, Ratbat, Rumble. Who was the th- fourth one? It's a laser beak. Laser beak, right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the, the red humanoid cassette tape doesn't show up here. But uh, Ratbat's pretty cool. So that's a good replacement. Laserbeak's a classic. La- Laserbeak, as Megatron referred to him, is his, was his most competent uh, henchman, you'll recall. Well, it's true. I mean, Laserbeak's the only Decepticon that gets anything done in the original uh, the original cartoon. God damn right. He successfully right. spies on the Autobots many times. Yes, he always succeeds in his missions. Anyway, right? Ra- Ravage, Ratbat, Rumble, and Laserbeak all eject out of, <laughs> out of Soundwave. Um... Discord is pissed that tea time has been interrupted. And the fight is on. Uh, Soundwave tries to shoot at Discord. Of course, Discord not easy to hit. And <laughs> Discord turns into a Transformer. Because that's what you do. And then he creates other iterations of Discord Transformers. One of which looks like a boombox. One of which looks like a like a hobby horse. Um, Classic stuff. And Soundwave has a great line here. Decrease absurdity or be deactivated. Best line in the comic. <laughs> best line in the entire series. Quite possibly the best line in comics to date. If oh, I... Steve, the one I thought you were going to go with was, hey, we don't give boo-boos, that's battle damage. <laughs> it's close second. Yeah. But de- decrease absurdity or be deactivated. I, um, I think I teared up a little bit. I had a moment. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to say stuff like that in our network chat. <laughs> um, anyway. So this goes on and on. Um, yeah, this is the line. That's next. Oh my, you're... <laughs> Fluttershy uh, says to Ravage, Oh my, your poor little nose, buddy. You have a boo-boo on it. And Rumble takes umbrage with this and says, Hey, we don't get boo-boos. Um... <laughs> well, I'm sure no pony wants th- uh, that's battle damage. Well, I'm sure no pony wants that. Yeah, yeah. Save it for the message boards. A little bit of meta humor there. Yep. Uh, Rumble smacks T out of Fluttershy's hands, and everybody stops at that point. Like that was a record scratch moment. You have all the little woodland creatures stop. Ravage and Ratbat stop. Discord stops. And now everyone's pissed at Rumble. And that's typical of Rumble, isn't it? To just piss off everybody. He's really good at putting his foot in his mouth in (laughs) many different ways. Uh, Both him and Frenzy are. Yes. Uh, So they all... (laughs) So Discord turns all the little woodland creatures into small robots. And they all jump on Soundwave. Uh, And they jump on Rumble. Yeah, yeah, even Ravage and Ratbat jump on Rumble. Um, and then we have a line here. Did he say friendship? Says Fluttershy. That's what you care about? Unquestionably, friendship superior. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I totally agree. Oh my god, see? If that's how you feel, that we could just start all over again and be friends. Um, and so they do. <laughs> that just ends with Soundwave and his cassette henchmen all being friends with Fluttershy and Discord and the Woodland Creatures. And Megatron says, hey, give me the information. And Soundwave says, eh, I'll do it eventually. That's the end of that one. This next one pairs up Windblade with uh, Rainbow Dash. This is the Flying Foxtrot. Um, And 
so yeah, Windblade shows up. She introduces herself to Rainbow Dash. They pal around for a bit, and they're gonna have a race to see who can be the fastest. This is Superman and the Flash. Okay. Um, so they start their race, and eventually, who shows up? But all right, who the hell are these off-breed, off-brand, multicolored jets that I've never seen before, Cole? Well, the one in pink is Misfire, and he is a, a later down the line toy jet who's not technically one of the Seekers, um, which are Starscream's troops. Okay. And the other three are called the Rainmakers. Um, the only one I know off the top of my head is, is Acid Storm. He's the green one. Um, but they were kind of an offshoot of the Seekers. They showed up in the cartoon like once or twice. And Acid Storm has the ability to make acid rain. That's yeah, his claim to fame. Because I remember the second iteration of Jet Decepticons were the ones where the um, the cockpit of the jet became their head, so they all looked like cone heads, which are not right. These yeah, ones. those were the those were the second group of uh, Decepticons uh, or of Seekers, affectionately known as the cone heads. Ha. Huh. Um. And then the Rainmakers were like the third or fourth group. Okay, um, they all they kind of, their heads kind of look like uh, like they could have been headmasters. Remember those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do look a little headmastery. All right, so uh, they show up, and of course they they are disrupting the race, and they're shooting at Windblade and Rainbow Dash. And Alexis, this is where Rainbow Dash says, "We're going to do the flying foxtrot," and Windblade goes, "What are you babbling about, little horsey?" And and they do a thing, and they essentially get the uh, what'd you call them, Cole? What are these Decepticons called? The Rainmakers. They get the Rainmakers to bunch up, and they <laughs> they are hoisted by their own petards as the missiles they fired turn back around and blow them all up. Wasn't the Rainmakers the name of a band back in like the eighties or nineties? I think you're thinking of Poison. No, didn't they do a song called "Let My People Go Go"? I think that's wham. Wake me up before you go, go, go. I'm checking this out. In the meantime, what'd you think of issue number three, Cole? Uh, issue number three was great. Um, I, again, it's kind of a pattern emerging. I, there's one strong story and one weaker story. I think that the, the first story, Pet Sounds with Fluttershy, was a lot more fun and had more going for it than Flying Foxtrot, which was basically one big action scene. Yeah, agreed. Um, but both had great elements to them. I thought that the use of Windblade, who is uh, kind of a contentious character among the fans, I thought that the use of Windblade was great. Um, and then in the first story, decrease absurdity or be, dis- be deactivated. <laughs> Need I say more? Yeah, that's good stuff. I thought that was a, that was a fun pairing with uh, like as they're mapping out these books. I could just imagine they're like the, you know they have like little cards with transformers and and My Little Ponies on them. Like, all right, we're gonna make this pairing. We're gonna make this like like they had to figure out the pairings first, right, before they could write the stories. Oh, um, clearly. You know, and like you know who 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 gives us the best grist for the mill? Which pairings do we do here? Uh, and I like the fact that they that they did some deep cuts here, and that it's it's not all the Bumblebee show, you know, because um, mm-hmm. there's 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 definitely too much of a tendency to rely on Bumblebee and Optimus Prime as if the other Autobots don't exist. Well, that's one thing that the IDW comics have always done well is they've always taken great pains to focus the story on more than just the fan favorite characters. Like Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Megatron, and Starscream are cool. They're all great. They're big movers and shakers. But let's talk about what's going on with these characters right now. What's Wheeljack doing? Right. What's uh, what's Perceptor doing right now? Where's Red Alert? You know, they kind of build a whole universe and use every part of it. Right. And what I really like is that they don't waste their time with useless Autobots like Cup. Hi, Ronnie. Ah, uh, <laughs> man. <laughs> you turbo Revan young punk. <laughs> I uh, had to get one in. All right. Uh, issue number four. This is our glorious conclusion. Uh, came out November 4th, 2020. Uh, our two stories are 
Strength in Numbers, written by Ian Flynn, artist is Sarah Petra Durocher. And then Finale, written by James Asmus, and artist is Tony Fleece. Um, this beginning one, we have my favorite My Little Pony, quite frankly, is, of course, the, the country farmer, Applejack. Fantastic. You are in the minority, my friend. There's a running gag that Applejack is the best background pony. Nope, she's the best pony ever. I love I love me some uh, surly country ponies. <laughs> what can I tell you? Well, the Insecticons, who was just the worst, by the way. Worst idea for a toy. Like, all right, we've got jets, we've got cars, we've got dinosaurs. What else do kids like? I don't know. How about bugs? All right. <laughs> So. Sure, why not? <laughs> and apparently the Insecticons can uh, refill on apples in addition to Energon. Because they oh, the are Insecticons will eat anything. Okay, yeah, because they are eating sweet apple acres. <laughs> yes, they are feeding on the trees and the apples, and there's like 87 of them here. There were only three initial insect- Insecticons. What's going on here, Cole? Oh, that's another uh, nod to the comics where the Insecticons uh, are not specific characters but more like a plague they're okay. um they're mass produced um so they're, they're like the shark decons yeah exactly they don't okay. have individual characters they're just there are these three types and there are billions of them gotcha all right well now that panel makes more sense well uh applejack gives them the hose <laughs> and she's this is why, like, I don't understand why people don't like Applejack, Alexis. Here she is defending her farm. She's spraying him with a hose. She's hitting him with sticks. She's yelling, get. <laughs> and now she's... Well, the, the thing with Applejack, for the record, there, the reason most people aren't, don't like Applejack that much, it honestly has nothing to do with her personality. It's the fact that out of the, all of the main six, she has had the least amount of development because all the other characters started with goals and things that they wanted to accomplish or character uh, traits that would help them develop more as characters. Applejack starts the end of, of My Little Pony exactly where she started. She's working her family's farm. Uh, you know, she's got her family, and that's it. You know, there, there is no real growth for her in the entire series other than I am doing what I love and I will continue to do it. Wasn't the series, though, about um, whatever the main character is, uh, Princess Twilight? Um, thank you. Princess Twilight about her growth and how she, I, from what I recall of the uh, first season, the, she was sort of a shut in who d- didn't find the need for others to be around her. And that was sort of the learning curve for her was go out and be in the world and make friends and learn that being in a community is important. And I thought that's what the show was sort of revolving around. So if you have a character or two that's just there as sort of a rock to lean on, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And there isn't, but again, she was the only character that went through that. All the other characters, including Twilight, did have growth. Uh, With Rarity, she was a fashion designer, but by the end of the series, she was opening multiple stores. She was actually... uh, The the final episode, you find out she's actually uh, started opening stores outside of Equestria. She's now making clothes for other species. Uh, you have Rainbow now. She wants to become uh, one of the Wonderbolts. It's the equivalent of the Blue Angels. Uh, Pinkie Pie, who is... Gr- you know, Pinkie- Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie don't really have goals, per se, but they have characters. Uh, like th- They have quirks and personalities that allow them to grow a little bit. Uh, Fluttershy obviously starts the show very meek, very quiet, very timid. She but we see her grow into a much more developed character. Pinkie Pie starts out the show a little bit more rambunctious, uh, very impulsive, and even she gets a little bit better by the end of the show. I don't think there's anything wrong, per se, with the idea of Applejack being the rock, that she starts where she starts the show where she ends the show as just happy on her farm. But that's the reason why I think a lot of fans don't really like her that much. Okay, I got your messages. Thank you. I'll have, to, I'll have to look at these uh, later, Alexis. All right. Yeah, you still got my message that, yes, I was right about the Rainmakers. Uh, no, I don't care about that. I'm looking at the My Little Pony stuff you sent me. <laughs> 
figures. I try to. The one time I actually try to jump the conversation into something that makes me sound more like an adult. <laughs> no, no, no. D- D- Discord, My Little Pony shipping. That's just all I care about right now. All right. Um, speaking of Discord, he shows up again. And uh, he's helping out Applejack with her problem there. And I guess now, now <laughs> somebody in the comments of the, of the site that I was using to read this comic referred to this panel as the Avengers Assemble moment. Yes. Oh, there's no doubt that that's what they were homaging with all the portals. It is totally an endgame moment, and I love it. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with the Apple family, and they all come out of portals. <laughs> and so, yes, you have an endgame moment here of Al- Applejack leading the charge of various My Little Pony, I guess, family members against the swarm of Insecticons. Yeah, the ver- the pilot episode actually shows you just how freaking big the Apple family mm. is. They are crazy huge. The rest of this is the Apple Jack family um, beating off the Insecticons uh, and sending them into retreat. And that's the end of that episode. I didn't quite get what happened with the one Insecticon... Um... It goes after the uh, the elderly green pony who we in the show is called Auntie Applesauce, mm-hmm. and she goes, "Don't you come any closer, leave me alone." And the Insecticon goes, "Oh no, order accepted." Yeah, yeah, I, I, so I think I saw that kind of acknowledgement. Went, eh, whatever. All right, that is. I can actually answer that question. Oh, okay. Please do. Uh, that Insecticon is called Bombshell, and he has these things called Cerebro shells, which are. Uh, bullets that he shoots that attach into robots' foreheads and he can then command them to do things. He shoots a Cerebro shell at him at her. You can kind of see she hits it away with her um, hoof and it hits him on the head. So now he has to listen to her commands. Oh, okay. It's really hard to see. It took me like two or three reads to figure it out. But if you look closely, you can kind of see where, where they're going with it. Yeah, I, I can see how. It, yeah, I can see it's going back on to him now. And yeah, I love anti applesauce. I can't believe that worked. <laughs> All right, so we don't get a strict delineation from the one story to the next. It just sort of bleeds into the next one with no heading. But it starts off with um, looks like Spike saying to uh, the princess, "Good news and bad news, princess can't cadence." Okay, first of all, that's not Spike. Who was that? That is. That is Smolder. In the second to the last season, Twilight and her friends start an official school of friendship. <laughs> and one of the main goals that Twilight has is to extend it to the other kingdom so it's not just ponies. And we are introduced to these six new characters, five of which are different species, who kind of become the main focus and, the uh, you know, just the point of view for the school. The other character is Princess Cadence, uh, she is the ruler of the Crystal Empire, and she is Twilight Sparkle's sister-in-law. And she is the Princess of Love. All right. Uh, we scouted each reported site where a strange visitor appeared. The villains seem to have cleared out. And the bad news, Princess Twilight's new allies are certain that the Decepticons are... Uh, th- that yeah, Are certain that the only means these Decepticons are planning something. Oh, heavens, did they have any idea as to what? And, of course, boom, that's when all your villains show up again. It's the glorious finale. Behold, Princess Queen Chrysalis returned to reclaim Equestria for the Changelings, and this time we didn't come alone. And, of course, Megatron says, Our demands are simple. Surrender all magical items within your castle walls and watch as we melt them down, uh, all down into Energon enhanced with magic. And, of course... With Equestria drained of its strongest magics, feel free to surrender everything else to me! Ha ha ha! And then uh, the Autobots show up. <laughs> that... Um, I have a question. The giant dragon dinosaur things behind the Decepticons, I don't recognize those from My Little Pony. So I have no idea what those are. Let me take a look at them. I will pull out my comic right now. Yeah, I don't know what those are either. Nope, not a clue. Moving on. All right, so Optimus shows up uh, and says, in that case, Megatron, 
Autobots and Ponies, transform and trot out till every pony are one. Can I just say that I physically cringed when I read those? <laughs> like, I had a physical reaction when I read Optimus Prime <laughs> saying transform and trot out. <laughs> you know, I missed it the first time. I Because in my head, I was like, oh, transform and roll out. And I saw her say till all are one. And I'm like, ha, ah, that's a callback to the movie. Um, and I just kept on reading. And then I'm reading the comments. And somebody wrote transform and trot out. I marked out. And I'm like, oh, is that what he said? And I wrote and I went back up again. I'm like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> transform and trot out. Get it? Because they're ponies. Get it? Get it, Alexis? Get it? Okay, so apparently I just did a little research. Those dragon-like things are the changelings, and they just turned into monstrous forms. Apparently, oh, okay. you're supposed to be able to identify that because they've got the uh, the same glowing blue eyes that all the other changelings do. All yeah. right, ki- kids, do you like splash pages? Because <laughs> that's all you're getting for the rest of this comic. You've got this massive uh, brouhaha between the Transformers and the My Little Ponies, and everyone's just shooting and fighting and. Uh, Soundwave gets a pie in the face, like you do. Uh, it's making you question it. Yeah, sure. Um, oh my god, I just noticed Rarity driving RC as a car. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, I, I stayed on this page for a while, like, trying to p- pick out all the little details. See, I had trouble picking up some of the details just because I'm reading this on Kindle for Mac, and Kindle mm-hmm. for Mac doesn't have a zoom-in function. Oh. So I am like straining my eyes just to read what Megatron is saying and to pick up all the. I didn't notice Sugar Bell and Big Mac in the front. I didn't notice Soren flying around Megatron. Here's one of the Wonder Bolts. So, yeah, there's a lot of details on this splash page I missed. Uh, yeah, and... the, the app I use to read comics has a zoom in feature. It's called Pulling the Comic Closer to My Face. Yeah. Um,. As we move on here, if you've forgotten about uh, Grimlock and Spike, well, forget no more, because they show up in the Space Bridge, and they join the fight. And Cole, oh my goodness, Spike has got the exosuit from the movie! Yup. Ah! Uh, I loved that Bumblebee is like, hey, it's the exosuit. And then it reveals that Spike is in it, but it's not the Spike that they thought it was, because that Spike is Spike from the cartoon and I don't know I've gone cross-eyed anyway so the line here changelings retreat our prizes this world abandon the Decepticons before we get dragged into theirs because the space bridge is open and sucking everything into it no says Megatron you promised me power what magic do they wield that could possibly stop us? You haven't learned by now? Friendship! And of course, Optimus Prime. The panel is Optimus Prime's chest is open, the matrix of leadership is laid bare, and there stands. There's the princess standing in front of the matrix of leadership. And uh, they merge together and send everybody back to where they came from. And so all the Transformers have gone back to Cybertron. Uh, the pony Equestria is uh, back to normal again. And um, Shockwave is working on a way to bring the power and the magic of Equestria back to Cybertron rather than having to go to Equestria. And that is where the, we end the book. So all I right. guess this was supposed to be a to-be-continued dawn, dawn, dawn ending. Yeah. I mean, they, they left it open in case they, you know... This is such a hot seller that people need to see more of it. And, and really, why wouldn't we? Um, <laughs> Cole, the, uh, give us your final thoughts here, this final issue, and then you know, your thoughts overall. So let's, let's sum it up and let's get on out, out of here. Well, first of all, something specific. Um, there's a scene where Megatron is about to fight uh, Twilight Sparkle, and she uses magic to cap his blaster with one of those orange safety caps that they put on gun toys. And I flipped out. I laughed my ass off at that. I love the look on Megatron's face. He's like, what the What hell? the hell is this? 
Um, Those darn ponies. I, I thought overall issue four was probably the weakest of the four. It was my least favorite of the four issues. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I still enjoyed it very much. Um, I just think that Applejack's story was sort of basic. Uh, there's Insecticons attacking the farm, and then everyone goes and fights the Insecticons, and we win. Yay! Yeah. And then the finale was a bunch of splash pages, like you said. It was just a big action scene. Um, my final thoughts on the series, though, uh, I would kill a man in front of his own mama to get more of this. <laughs> okay. Um, I am 100% on board for more Transformers My Little Pony. I can't wait for the next uh, crossover, and I hope it happens soon. Uh, Alex, I'll go to you in just a second. Here's why I'm glad the series was done the way that it was. Because I, you know, especially after reading Revolution and some of the other IDW Transformers books, the My Little Ponies are not something I wanted to see taken super serial. And right, they, exactly. Yeah, and so they treated the My Little Ponies like the My Little Ponies are in the cartoon, and instead of bringing the My Little Ponies to the like the super serial IDW Revolution Transformers level, they brought the Transformers, while still keeping them largely intact personality-wise, they brought them to the My Little Pony level, and I thought that made the book more enjoyable. Um... I'm also glad that I, my one fear with this was that in order to try to make it all work, we were going to get some convoluted story, which, we, you know, Alexis and I have done a lot of uh, crossover books similar to this. We did Batman T- TMNT earlier this year. We've done, you know, quite a number of books, uh, not just Alexis, but Jesse and I, Chris and I. And, you know, I get cro- you know, I always refer to Dark Side War as sort of my go to example of this, but I just, you know, the. Sometimes the writers write themselves into a tizzy, making things more complicated than they have to. And I was like, please don't do that with this. I really just want simple. And that's what I got, and it was lovely. Alexis, I'll give you the final word. I agree that the Applejack story was probably the weakest, and I think part of that was that they really needed to work better on the uh, fight sequences, which I think they were kind of limited. The Apple family are Earth ponies. They're not unicorns. They're not pegasi, so they didn't have magic and they can't fly. So they're obviously limited on what they can do to fight. But still, there wasn't that many panels of them showing them fight, and then all of a sudden, the Insecticons have retreated, and it's like, yay, we saved the farm! And I'm like, I was kind of hoping to see a little bit more, you know... I mean, Applejack is the strongest of the main six. I was like, come on, let's see her, you know, Apple Buck and Incepticon and see him go flying over the mountains or something. <laughs> you know, it's what she's known for. But I agree. I love that they did not take this too seriously. It is done with just the right amount of fun and silliness for both sides to enjoy it. I really hope we get more of these. And I'll go ahead and tell you, like I said, I downloaded these on Kindle for Mac. But when the heart, when the full trade comes out, I fully intend to buy it because I want this in an actual, like, physical form in my collection. Yeah, I might, um, when the trade comes out, pick it up for my daughter. Um, I was telling her about it at dinner tonight, and I actually think, you know, like, she's not really into the superhero comics, but she was a fan of My Little Pony, and I think she'd get a kick out of this, so... Uh, if you've got you know young girls at home, young boys at home, they uh, they might actually enjoy this. It's it's a really fun, um, you know, juvenile, but that's okay. You know, all three adults here, all we're talking about this, so clearly it's fine. Um, it's a it's an enjoyable juvenile book, and I would highly recommend it. That said, that takes us to the end of our show. Cole, what do you got going on these days? What do you want to plug, if anything? Well. Um, I am a, uh, a Twitch affiliate now. I'm uh, on Twitch professionally, quote unquote. Uh, you can find me at twitch.tv slash thefilmtwit. Um, I stream a variety of different games uh, Monday evenings and Tuesdays during the day, uh, usually about 6 to 10 on Mondays and noon to 4 ish on Tuesdays. Uh, that all times Eastern. All right. Very good. Cole will be back in January ish. Uh, when... Yeah, I think we decided the middle of January. Yes. Uh, January 14th, Cole will be back for the second episode of The War for Cybertron. This would be chapter two. I think it's called Siege. 
So we'll have Cole on for that, and then whenever Chapter 3 drops, and then eventually we'll have him on source material so we can discuss all 9,000 pages of All Hell Megatron. So <laughs> you can look for that in the future. I assume you're going to probably join Jesse and I when we do in, uh, in February Back to the Future Transformers. I'd love to. All right. February 1st, mark it on your calendar. Um, unless Jesse's back to doing these full-time again, in which case it'll be the week before, because he puts the love in. That's how Jesse <laughs> says it. He puts the love in, not me. I uh, I bake the statues of dragons and pony shipping. Speaking of which, Alexis. No kidding, Jesse puts the love in. I'm working on his order right now. Oh, very good. Speaking of yep. orders, what are you plugging? Yep. Honeysuckle Rose Creations. We're right in the middle of our uh, big holiday rush. Just a reminder for everyone that if you order by December 18th, we will still be able to get your products out to you in time for Christmas. I was at the post office today and I confirmed this. And another reminder that we are still doing our big charity drive. Every order that you place at Honeysuckle Rose Creations through either our Etsy store or our handmade at Amazon store Every order placed, we will donate five dollars to St. Jude's. That is going on, that started on Black Friday, and that is going to go till Christmas night. So, if you're if you're looking for a great holiday gift for the geeky ones in your life, go ahead and check out our shop, and you will not only be purchasing a wonderful present for a very good friend or loved one, but you're going to be helping out a lot of people as well. And, of course, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, and under duress Twitter. That's Honeysuckle Rose Creations, the intersection of geek and chic. All right. Last week uh, was the conclusion of Chris Sheehan Month. We looked at the Hart Fisher, Jeffrey Dahmer book. Uh, if you love listening to Alexis, and I know you do because I see the numbers, she joined me on a TV party last week to discuss the reboot of Animaniacs Season 1. Uh, Jesse Starcher and I reviewed the new hate breed album that's in the archives this week myself and chris bailey chris bailey chris bailey took to uh the tv party to review aew winter is coming yes we talked all about kenny omega versus john moxley uh tomorrow the podsman will ride again and we'll t- we'll look at nxt takeover war games um the sbtu is coming up in the middle of the month our Submission for that, the source material submission will be Captain Confederacy. And uh, Jesse Starch is bringing the love to that one. So you'll get music and you'll get, I'm sure, a, uh, um, a gag reel, the whole nine yards. Jesse Starch is back one time for the SBTU. Speaking of Jesse, he and I will be reviewing the new Clutch uh, Weathermaker volume series uh, one. And then Andrew Graham, fresh off being sick, <laughs> will finally be on the mend. And we'll get Crown Season 4 dealt with on TV Party. And that's all my plugs. I want to thank Cole Marantet for hanging out tonight. Uh, As always, Alexis, glad to have you on the show. Uh, We'll see you next week. Alexis will be back for uh, Batman 3 Jokers um, along with Christian. So that'll be fun to have you guys together. The Mega Powers will will, uh, unite. Till then, be well, be safe, and behave.